Hello and welcome to this review for my Apple IIc keyboards. This is a bit of a special episode, so I hope you enjoy it. Three years ago, I did a review on this new old stock replacement module of an Apple IIc keyboard. It was absolutely delicious, but I couldn't exactly plug it into my own computer, so I couldn't use it, and of course, it lacked a case. Since that time, I've managed to get it working over USB, and I commissioned a local woodworkers to make a custom case for it. I originally didn't dare do this, as of course any place to do with carpentry is filled with sawdust, and I didn't want to risk ruining the pristine Alps switches in it, which are notoriously sensitive to stuff like that. This all changed when I got this in, a donation of an old Apple IIc, this time a whole unit. I was therefore able to take this one's modules out to give them something to work with and build around. Exposing this to any dust wasn't a problem because A, it was already dirty, and B, this one doesn't use Alps switches, but instead Apple's own and rather notoriously bad hairpin switches, which really couldn't get any worse anyway. The woodworkers then put in the Alps module when the case was finished, and I think they did a terrific job of it. Thanks again, guys. I had them make the case deliberately roomy to maximize the sound potential, which is one of the smexiest advantages of Alps. Small cases often kill the bass and volume of these switches, but in this case it's deliciously amplified. I mean, now that's what you call a clicky keyboard. It's somewhat tall, which might look like it's very uncomfortable to use, but if you type with floating hands, like me, this is not really a problem. It's not that steeply sloped either, about as much as a normal board, so honestly, it's not bad. At worst, you can use a wrist rest with it. The case is made out of double stained, double lacquered, oak veneered MDF, 9mm thick. I originally thought about making the case out of a nice solid hardwood, like mahogany, cherry, <laughs> that would have been pretty ironic, wouldn't it? Or walnut, but they cautioned me that such woods can warp over time, which would have been pretty terrible, as well as a lot more expensive. In any case, the stained oak veneer looks just as good in my opinion, and is much better suited to the purpose. The weight of the unit is 1755 grams, which is actually quite a lot for a 60% keyboard, well over three times the weight of a KB Paradise V60 or a HHKB. Sounds quite solid too. This is what it looks like on the inside. The board is screwed onto a ledge on which the rest of the case is screwed. The unit uses a retro connector plug-in converter from Tindy, which is folded underneath the PCB, which is in turn supported by these two pillars on either side of the converter. These pillars are screwed into the bottom plate. This plate is screwed into the top case with four 25mm screws. There's a hole at the back for a mini USB plug to connect through too. Apart from some general directions on my part, the case was entirely designed by them, so shout out to Brandhoff the Main. Well done, guys! The Apple IIc, short for compact, was this 3.4 kilogram piece of work from 1984, which looked like an old-fashioned answering machine. It was essentially a scaled-down version of the Apple IIe and Apple's first portable computer. The concept of portable computers took off in the early 80s after the success of the Osborne 1 and Compact Portable, although unlike many of its competitors in this segment, the Apple IIc lacked a built-in monitor. Interestingly, it was designed to compete with the IBM PC Junior which, being infamously one of the biggest commercial failures in history, you'd think would pose little competition. However, the PC Junior, despite its monumental failure, still outsold it. The 2C sales were less than a tenth of what Apple expected them to be. Ouch. This is possibly why getting hold of one isn't all that easy, especially for a good price. They are, or at least Alps models are, highly sought after because they're the only model of keyboard known that come with amber Alps. A switch that appears to have been specifically developed for it. The original models used Apple hairpin switches instead though, which are god awful. I'll come back to these in a sec. The Alps models were commissioned later, an unsurprising move considering Apple and Alps had a lot of history together, even going as far as Alps buying Apple's factory in Ireland. As mentioned, they're known mainly for the Amber Alp switches, although some replacement modules have been found with very late Blue Alps instead. Maybe they had discontinued the Ambers by then. Also, the 2C Plus used Orange Alps instead, so not even all Alps 2Cs came with Ambers. Amber Alps are a variation of Blue Alps and appear to be contemporaneous with them. 
They're very similar, except much more tactile. In fact, they're among the most tactile switches ever created. The increased tactility compared to blues is due to the steep angle of the teeth of the click leaf. As you can see, the difference is noticeable. Thankfully, Harta, the keyboard hero, has measured force curves of both switches, on which you can clearly see how hugely tactile these switches are. The weighting is a bit stiffer due to the higher peak force, but is otherwise fairly comparable. I think they use the same spring weights, to be honest. The tactility is almost overpoweringly strong. I actually prefer the more balanced feel of SKCM Blue, but this is still a delicious switch. Very smooth and superbly sharp tactility. Nice. It's a bit like Box Jades, except meatier and better sounding. Especially in light of how nice the Alp switches feel, the contrast with the turbo terrible hairpin switches is staggering. They consist of a movable spiral contact plate and a static one which are pushed together. When pressure is applied to the top, the tactility and click come from the exposed hairpin sitting at the top. This is pushed open by cams in the slider, and when the spring clears these cams, it slams upward against the slot keeping the spring in place, causing a drop in force, which is felt as a tactile event and is accompanied by a clicky noise. In the patent, they even dare call this an improvement over capacitive switches. In truth, the clicky noise isn't that apparent and at the very least inconsistent. Some are clicky, but many are almost silent, or at least the ones in this board are, possibly because they're covered with a contamination shield, which might be interfering with the clickers. The travel feels very rough and unnaturally short, and while the tactile bump is quite noticeable, the overall key feel is extremely inconsistent across the board. Quite a lot of the keys exhibit significant binding as well, which is a terrible combination with short travel switches, as it makes you question your own typing, forcing you to hammer down the keys. It's easily one of the worst switches ever made, not quite MEI, Matsumi Miniature or Smith Corona Leaf Spring terrible, but it would have definitely made the top 10 if I'd have had them at the time. It uses Apple's signature shortened right side. They chopped half a unit off of these keys here, which on ISO models like this one results in this pathetic sliver of an enter key. I mean, what the fuck is that? What is it? Both keyboards also have latching switches at the top, in both cases made by Alps, but they're not the same type. In the Alps model, it's SKCL lock, while in the Apple Hairspring model, it's SKFL lock. As they have no function in this adapted version, I chose to have the case molded over them in my custom keyboard. They're barely pressable in their original case anyway. Look how terribly this works. If you don't have at least a minimum of nailage, you'll never be able to press them. Both keyboards use the same type of keycap, albeit with a different mount, obviously, and there appears to be a slight color difference. They're flat, uniprofile cylindrical keycaps made out of thick PBT, with die-sublimed lettering. PBT doesn't yellow, which is why the keys are still so white, with the exception of the spacebar, which is made out of ABS. As was typical of Apple for a long time, the lettering is in the wrong corner of the keycap. It's got that hideous oblique font, and the homing bumps are on the wrong keys, they're on D and K instead of F and J. Overall, the typing sound is still excellent though. Here's what it sounds like compared to a Razer Black Widow with Cherry MX Blue switches to provide a bit of a relatable comparison for most people. But anyone can beat Cherry Amex Blue, the question is, can it beat some Alps heavyweights? In my comparison video, I concluded that, at least in my opinion, the best sounding stock Blue Alps keyboard is the Leading Edge DC2014. So here's what they sound like compared to each other.
Now, I don't want to brag or anything, but to me that sounds both significantly fuller and bassier than the leading edge. Not bad results for sure. Overall, I'm extremely happy with this keyboard, which I christened Project A according to my usual naming convention. It cost me a fair few pennies, but it was worth every one. It's a great little board if you're up for making a custom 60%. Better miss the hairpin spring model though, and if you use the Alps one, be sure to keep your custom case large and roomy. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on both of these keyboards. Next week, as teased previously, we're going to look at an actual up and running vintage computer.